Welcome to the Jonathan Kenlock Show. With casino gaming thrust back onto the scene again, Michigan voters potentially will be deciding whether or not there should be an expansion in casino gaming here in the state of Michigan, or maybe not. That will be left up to the courts. Well, we have here on the show one of the most knowledgeable individuals as it relates to casino gaming, specifically here in the state of Michigan. We have Marvin Beatty, Vice President of Community and Public Relations for Greektown Casino. When we come back, we'll engage in a conversation with Marvin Beatty from Greektown Casino. Welcome back to the Jonathan Kenlock Show. In 1997, the city of Detroit identified the three casinos that they would negotiate a long-term agreement with as relates to licensing here in the city of Detroit. Since then, a number of the original investors have been replaced as well as you've had a number of these agreements changing from their initial introduction to the citizens of Detroit as it relates to the entertainment, size of hotel, and the impact on the economy, lo uh, economy locally here in the city of Detroit. Well, since the, con the construction of the casinos and the final um, opening of the last uh, casino uh, under these development agreements, the Greektown Casino, there is now a move among some business individuals here in the state of Michigan to expand casinos in the city of Detroit as well as the state of Michigan. We have here in the studio Marvin Beatty, who is Vice President of Community and Public Relations for Greektown Casino. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Jonathan. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, you have um, been, you're one of the most uh, well knowledgeable individuals as it relates to the issues surrounding Greektown Casinos here in Michigan, but especially here in Detroit. We currently have the three casinos that are in place and you have a group of investors who've decided to seek further expansion of those casinos operations here in the state of Michigan. But it's being met with resistance by the current uh, casino owners. Um, tell me, why is there no longer a need for um, additional, what, there's no need, I should say, for additional casinos here in, in Michigan? Well, it, here's the thing, uh, Jonathan. Uh, the casinos, there's 25 casinos in the state of Michigan currently, 25. State of Michigan's population is getting smaller, not getting larger. The, it, it comes to a point of oversaturation. Uh, and the concern that, that the casinos have throughout the state of Michigan, the tribal casinos as well as the three Detroit commercial casinos, is that there is a legitimate process that's been established by um, the people of the state of Michigan that says that certain things must happen before the expansion of gaming can happen. What we're saying is, is let that process take place. And the reality of this ballot initiative is that it does not allow for the legitimacy of all of those things to take place. Specifically, each community uh, has the right to validate whether or not they would like to see a casino in their community. What this ballot proposal calls for is it forces based on somebody's investment, on some big shooter's investment, to put a certain amount of money in, they can put a casino based on whatever address they want. So they're able to put it within a community irrespective of whether the community itself has validated its interest in casinos. That's just one of the many problems that exist with this proposal. This proposal is calling for eight casinos in the state of Michigan, four within Southeast Michigan, one in Detroit, one in Romulus, one in Macomb County, and one in Oakland County. Our concern here in Detroit is this. If you build a casino in Romulus, a casino in Oakland and Macomb County, what does that do to the city of Detroit? The city of Detroit last year got $160 million in revenue directly to its budget, to its, to its, uh, 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 its account uh, last year, $160 million just in gaming tax. That does not include employee tax, city resident tax, uh, property tax, all of the different taxes, plus a municipal service fee 
that we pay $12 million just for police and fire. So we are paying for a, a very special unit of police officers and firefighters that would respond to our facility based on our demand. So we, we're making a huge contribution, well over $2 billion have gone directly to the general fund for the city of Detroit. That has been one of the selling points uh, that the uh, investors who are trying to expand casino gaming here in the state of Michigan, that's one of the selling points that they've been using, that it would help the, um, the, the distressed budgets within these communities that they're trying to um, locate these casinos. But let's just talk about the broader question of casino gaming and the impact that it's had here on the state of Michigan just in general. We have a, we're in a state where you have the, one of the most, where well, you have the, uh, some of the most um, um, uh, underprivileged um, individuals, un underemployed individuals, as well as individuals who are debt ridden, some of the most debt ridden individuals in, in this nation, sure. right here in, the, in, in, in our state. Sure. How has casino gaming benefited these individuals and has it had a negative impact on folks who, ba who basically gamble something that they don't have, which is money. Absolutely, and, and, but, but that's a choice that adults have. And they had that same option when they could just go to Windsor or when they went to Indian Casino. So, you know, uh, the availability of, of, of casinos uh, was put here primarily for two things. One, to employ close to 10,000 people here in the city of Detroit, number one. Number two, to bring a huge amount of tax revenue to the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan. And, and number three, to provide an entertainment venue for all of the uh, residents of Southeast Michigan. We've accomplished all three of those things. Well, but Marvin, what I'm saying is the city of Detroit needs more money, the uh, state of Michigan needs more money, and all of these communities around the state need more money. And the state is not willing enough to create enabling legislation to allow for these communities to find new revenues through taxes, fees, and other, um, other areas that the cities um, would like to, to explore. Um, so casino gam gaming, I mean, that, that's an option, like you said. Uh, wouldn't more be better as far as these communities would be concerned as well as um, more be better for the, uh, for the customers? Well, it, it, conceivably, you could say yes. In reality, the answer is absolutely not. And here's the reason. The Southeast Michigan population has not expanded over the last 13 years now that the casinos have been open. The projection back in 1996 of what the revenue would generate in the, state, in the city of Detroit from the three casinos, which is now really four because we have Windsor, would be approximately $1.6 billion. Well, since then, we have never achieved a $1.6 billion revenue and between the four casinos in Detroit. So, we, so, we, have to, we have to take a break okay. and we're gonna continue this discussion on the, uh, on the other side. This is Jonathan Kenlock, Marvin Beatty of the Greek Town Casino, and we will be right back after this break. Welcome back to the Jonathan Kinlock Show. Marvin, you were talking about the early estimates as far as revenues that the three casinos potentially would have garnered, um, which was a selling pitch for the citizens to support these casinos in the state of Michigan, particularly here in Detroit. And you say that you have not met that um, those estimates. You said 1.6. There's other sources that say the estimates were a revenue potential was between 1.2 and $2 billion. We all know that developers initially, early on, to get things through, sure. you know, they fluff them doggone sure. numbers. Well, you know, I think that realistically, it, the impression was that those were real, those were legitimate numbers based on the population, based on what they thought, as, as Michigan has the greatest number of people going to Las Vegas of any state in the, in the, in the country. So, so those estimates were based on some legitimate, you know, some measurements um, that would ultimately get you to that number. But the reality of it is we haven't reached that number and we haven't reached that number and we won't reach that number because one, the population's not there. Two, the economy doesn't meet that expectation. And, and the reality of this is, is if they add 
four new casinos to southeast Michigan to within 20 miles of the city of Detroit. There is no new population. The people who have never attended casinos or, or visited casinos in, in, in Detroit or in Windsor over the last 13 years, what's going to make them go now? But let me, let me ask, is, is some of this um, impact that you're, negative impact you're having on your revenues self-inflicted? Because early on, there was a lot more be bells and whistles that were attached to these casinos. And somehow, along the change in administrations, we, see, we saw the development agreements and the promises that were um, included in the early stages of this um, conversation shrink, shrink by administrations to the point that you uh, reduce the number of, of hotel um, rooms, the bedroom, I mean, the hotel rooms, as well as um, that directly would impact what? Profits as, as well as uh, gaming of uh, uh, revenue. Uh, revenue. Well, the reality of this is this. It was clear that an 800 room hotel, uh, three properties would only kill the existing hotel stock that exists today. Michigan has the largest, the highest uh, increase in hotel usage of any place in the country to date. And in part that's because others have been allowed to, to maintain themselves. The book Cadillac has come online and there's a number of others that have come online. The Doubletree. All of those are doing better numbers now than they've ever done. Well, I'm saying when the casinos were, when the city council and the mayor, the previous administration, Kilpatrick administration and council at that time, modified those development agreements, Book Calac was not online. That's correct. And so what I'm saying is, could those rooms that are now being um, filled over at Book Calac been filled and uh, to the benefit of, uh, the, of the casinos? Well, the reality of it is this. At the time that that deal was struck between the city administration, the city administration was in a financial bind that was about to take them under. Head over the barrel. Head over yo, the barrel. Yo, yo, we so. gave them $100 million. We gave them $33 million a piece in order to help the city get through its financial crisis. That was, that was what we did in order to reduce the number of hotel rooms. All I'm saying to you is this, numbers don't mean anything if you don't have heads to put in the beds. And where we are now is that other entities, the community, the downtown community is better today as a result of existence of other hotels. Not just casino oh. hotels. Of okay, course so it I'm is. Saying, I'm, so I'm saying what I'm saying. Oh, y'all. You know, but what I'm saying is the. But in the in the broader scheme of things, that you all potentially could have benefited from those additional rooms. But also, let me say, I know you gave that infusion of cash to the city of Detroit. But guess what? It also gave you a, a long-term agreement with the uh, with the city of Detroit as far as the license agreement. How we long had is 30, that? We had 30 years to begin years. with. We had 30 years to well, start what I'm, with. What I'm saying the is original the agreement way, called well, for the 30 original, years. That's what I'm saying, the original yeah. agreement. But what I'm saying, so in other words, the city was basically calling down or calling in um, some expected revenue in, a, in an agreement that some view was too long in the first place. No, 30 they, years. it wasn't expected revenue. The city has continually down the road, down the road, continually the gotten its revenue and and all I'm saying to you is, is that we would have not been able to fill 800 hotel rooms. Okay. We would have not been able to fill that. So the reality of it is, for the greater good, there's a greater good issue here that, that, that many folks don't want to, to acknowledge. The greater good is that downtown Detroit is better today than it would have been had we put these big monstrosities up here and not been able to fill them and kill the rest of the opportunity and the vitality that is beginning to create itself downtown. Every hotel is being filled up. You come down here on the weekend, it's what's going on anywhere. You can't find more activity anywhere in the country than you can find in downtown Detroit. That's because every single pocket of this community is now creating its own vitality based on the fact that we've created energy, enthusiasm, and people come here to visit and, and experience the benefits of casinos and all of the other amenities that downtown has to offer. Well, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, I want to have a conversation about the future of gaming here in the state of Michigan. You have Racinos, that was, uh, which was proposed a few years ago and was shot down, and other uh, gaming uh, expansions that are taking place around the country. Is that even possible here in the state of Michigan? So we'll continue our discussion with Marvin Beatty on the other side of this break.
Welcome back to the Jonathan Kinlock Show. Marvin, the opportunity for expansion as it relates to gaming here in the state of Michigan is limited somewhat because unless the voters have their say on certain aspects of gaming, um, it's not the lottery commission nor the state, state legislature is able to expand gaming here in the state. That is one of the things that the uh, petitioner, the folks who gathered the petition to amend the constitution said that they were doing. They were trying to correct some of the ills that was in the initial um, amendment to the constitution establishing casino gaming here in the state. You have um, slot, slot machines being um, desired by horse, horse, horse uh, race organiza racing organizations as well as the uh, prohibition on co internet gaming where it is uh, expanded and working in other parts of this country. So is there a need to take a look at casino gaming, or no, gaming as a whole within the state constitution? Well, first of all, uh, internet gaming in the United States is illegal. Uh, if you're betting on an internet, you are betting illegally. Um, there is a proposal within the, the United States Congress to add, to legalize uh, internet gaming in, in, in this country. Um, and the state of Michigan. When I, when I say states, I'm talking about some countries. Right. right. Oh, well, yeah. It's, right. Yeah. Around the world, it's 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 legal. In in the, in the United States, it's illegal. Right. Correct. Um, but states around the country are looking to approve internet gaming. Michigan is one of those that will look to approve, improve, or add internet gaming to this overall picture. So gaming is expanding, uh, in spite of what um, these proposed casinos are saying. It's expanding in a way that allows people to, there is a casino within two hours of any citizen in the state of Michigan, two hours. Now, how many more casinos do you need and what value does that bring? The reality of this is, is that you're moving money from one pocket to the other. You're not going to expand the number of employees because we're going to lose employees. And the tribal casinos are going to lose employees as a consequence. We just added Toledo and Cleveland. So we've added now, so the reality of this is within, if this proposal was to pass, we'd have nine casinos within 50 miles of the city of Detroit, nine. Now tell me where in the world is that going to benefit the people who you talked about, those who don't have jobs. I'm saying to you that the investment world is not going to put that kind of money uh, in a proposal. Well, what I'm saying is these individuals who gathered the petitions, who are seeking for the Supreme Court now to intercede and making sure that this make the ballot in November, sure. they're saying that they have investors, they have billionaires who are willing to invest their money into these casinos. So that, that is a question um, that these individuals are saying that they have basically um, answered. The reality of it is, doesn't the state, doesn't the people in these communities have the right to know who those people are before they vote for it? Don't, shouldn't they have some understanding, just like they did in, in, in the city of Detroit, they were vetted, that they were approved by a, a, a group of people and they were vetted uh, in the investors? Isn't that, that's not changing. Is, is, the, is the proposal, would that modify the licensing requirement that's currently in place? Yes, it is. Okay, because explain. Because what, what, this, what this would allow is these people would automatically have a casino in the state of Michigan automatically by virtue of the vote. But, would, but wouldn't, I be, wouldn't this speak to this amendment, speak to the locations, but you're saying that this amendment would allow, for, would circumvent the responsibility of the state to vet individuals Absolutely. from their... Oh, Absolutely. Okay. Wow. Absolutely. And, and, and that's the problem with this situation. There are so many problems. And many of these people here in Detroit are talking about an African-American casino. Look. Well, well, well now, no, no, you, you early on, the, when it was first introduced and it get the, the sales pitch for Detroit right. was having um, minority participation. Absolutely. We have the, I supported we have that, the, and I still the, support that we potential. We have the blackest city in this nation that has the brokest group of African Americans, and it makes no sense with all of the, with the billions of dollars that is basically um, being spent in this community. And for the most part, we don't own anything. We owned had interest in a major um, gaming um, operations or gaming operations, and they were booted out. No, they weren't booted out. They were paid out. They were booted of, out with a buck. Booted out with a buck. Because some of the folks did not want to leave. Well, so they say, but they took the money. That's true. So they say they. So now they're back again to do the exact same thing. I question whether the legitimacy of these individuals who are looking to do the same thing under the guise of an African-American-owned casino, 
when the reality of it is they themselves don't have the economic wherewithal to produce from, that. From, from, what, from, my, from my standpoint, when I, look, the bottom line is I agree with you, it's all about the bug for sure. the folks who are investing Absolutely. in it. But we have to have the conversation about creating environments and creating opportunities for minorities, and particularly blacks in the city, to be able to begin to own things. They're, 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 part of the sales pitch initially was that these casinos was going to create a pocket or a pool of a real money to well, allow right. for businesses that's to right. um, to open and to be able to um, start you know startup money. There was startup money and that was available, and, and, and that, that has was happened. reduced. And that's happened. And that has well, happened. Can you tell me, give me an example of some businesses that benefited from that pool of money? Women's Economic Group uh, are, are, is one that. I'm talking about one specific business that came. To no, that's this what pool. I, that's that is one specific business. That's the name of it. Okay. Women's Economic Group. Oh, that's okay. just that's one specific business. Another but, one. But there are. Um, I, I can tell you. Um, uh, let, let me just. Um, um, uh, there's a food service company that is very much involved uh, in in um, in, in in developing and doing business with casinos. There's a lot of businesses that currently are doing business, but let me let me explain that quickly. They know the Michigan Gaming Control Board is the licensing entity for this venue, not the casinos. The Michigan Gaming Control Board are the ones that determine whether or not these individuals can be licensed in order to do business. They so you apply. Said that so you're saying that changes no, it, under that proposal? Absolutely. Uh, okay, so absolutely. I, don't, I, did not, I don't recall them eliminating it. But well, it, it doesn't eliminate the Gaming Control Board, but what I'm saying is based on those African-American-owned businesses that are participating in the gaming industry today, they must be vetted through the Gaming Control Board. Right. We, as, as, as um, uh, casino owners, are continuing to press businesses to continue to apply for licenses so that we can do business. We have a commitment that we've made that a, a percentage of our business, 50% of our employees are all Detroiters. 33% of every single dollar that we spend has to go to Detroit-based minority-owned businesses. We look is for that, those is, people. That's a promise made? Is that a promise it's, being kept? And it's a promise kept. It's a promise kept. And we have measurables that can show you that we're doing all of those things to make sure that we live up to our commitment. And as much as these casinos were established by, you know, public support and public initiative, is there an annual report given um, to, I to know, the city of Detroit, to, to, the, the, to, to Detroit City Council? That's available to the public? Absolutely, it's available to well, the public. Well, if it's got in the council, it's available Absolutely. to the public. So, I mean, look, our books are open. We well, don't we're, like we're, we're, we're out of time. This, this is a great conversation. It I'll is. basically, it I'll is. definitely be reaching back out to you all Good. for an update. I know of no safe repository of the ultimate power of society but the people, and if we think them not enlightened enough, the remedy is not to take power from them, but to inform them by education. That's what I hope I do here each week on the Jonathan Kenlock Show, educate you on all of these issues that affect us. We'll be back with you next week, same time, same station. Have a great week.